Happy Halloween. I know it's not Halloween for y'all, but the day of me recording this, it is Halloween, so figured I'd say that. And welcome to Computer Science Terminology Part 2. If you didn't catch Part 1, there it is right there. That's where we went over a lot of the basics, and now we're getting a little bit more complex, starting off with machine language versus programming language. In order to differentiate the two, you have to understand that computers and humans understand information in different formats. Whenever you save data, such as a Word document or a Premiere project, the computer stores that in a format that it'll understand called binary or otherwise known as machine language. Binary is a language made up of combinations of zeros and ones. Each character that you'll see on your keyboard, numbers, special characters, punctuation, letters, spaces, tabs, and everything in between has their own binary representation. That means a combination of zero and ones are different for each and every character. And then there's something that I like to describe in a way that is between binary and our human language, and that is ASCII code. ASCII code is a numerical code, but instead of having zeros and ones like binary or having the actual number or the actual letter like English, it picks two numbers, zero through nine, for a particular letter. Doesn't matter if it's an A or B or C, they're all gonna be different. And they'll even be different from uppercase to lowercase letters. But that format is also known to us as decimal format. And since that is base 10, as you can see, because the two numbers are chosen between zero and nine, those are 10 numbers. And I'm sure you can guess binary is base two. That's because they choose only zero or one. In all honesty, I'm not too sure how well that came across to you. So let's try to consolidate our thoughts and really drive this point home. And I think a real world example will do best. So let's say we're typing something in Microsoft Word. We type the letter A. We're gonna keep it real simple. We type the letter capital A. The numerical value, ASCII code, of that is 65, I think. Let me check. Yeah, for capital A, the numerical code is 65. When you save that data from your Word document into your computer, it saves the equivalent of 65 in binary for your computer. So basically you type in A, capital A, the numerical code for that is 65, and then there's a unique binary code that is the equivalent of ASCII code, the numerical code, 65, and the binary code, the zeros and ones, is what is saved into your computer and what your computer can read. That's machine language. It's also referred to as low level language. It's considered to be low level because that's a language that machines can understand. And programmers, well, programmers understand programming languages, also known as high level languages. And just like in English, we have a set of rules to follow and that is grammar, everything that that entails. A programming language has its own set of rules called syntax. It also has a set of defined words or keywords, and these have a specific meaning within that programming language. And unfortunately, Humans have no idea how to choose one language or another. So just like we have so many different spoken languages, we have also so many different programming languages. Some are better suited for web development and even within web development, there are different languages to do exactly what you need. And then there are different that build mobile applications. And then there are different that build enterprise applications. And there are different that build a hacking software, or machine learning, or what have you. you, you get the gist. But in addition to those differences, we also split our programming languages into classifications called programming paradigms. So if we look at the actual word paradigm, we see that that's a way of thinking or a way of doing something. Essentially, it's just a mindset. A programming paradigm is a way of classifying something based on the methodology of that programming language. A few of the common types of program paradigms are functional, procedural, imperative, and object-oriented. As an example, we have two programming languages, Java and C. However, Java is an object-oriented programming language, while C is a procedural programming language. And for now, we don't need to know what it means to classify a programming language as object-oriented or procedural, but it does help understanding that there are different classifications for different programming languages. Now onto understanding writing and saving code. So basically, we've discussed this in part one of computer science terminology, which is that programming essentially means to write code. That code is written to create a program. A program is essentially an application, and an application does something. Let's compare this to something a little bit more simple like an essay. So when you write an essay, you open a piece of software, an application like Microsoft Word, you create a file in Microsoft Word, you type some stuff and then you save it as a document or a PDF. 
Writing code is essentially the same thing. Instead of using Microsoft Word, you'll use any type of text editor, whether that be Notepad, Notepad++, Atom, I can go on and on about this, or some type of IDE. And that is Integrated Development Environment IDE. While a text editor is a hammer in your tool belt, an IDE is essentially the tool belt that has all of the tools within that tool belt. So an IDE will have your text editor, a compiler, a runtime environment, and a debugger. So it has all of the tools you need to create a proper program. And a debugger, very helpful, it's a tool that programmers use to find mistakes in their code. And mistakes in their code are called bugs, hence debugger. Bugs can appear at different times within the development process, whether that be preventing your code from compiling or preventing your program, your application from executing, or maybe your application is just doing something incorrectly. There are plenty of jokes that hop around the software development industry, one of which being something along the lines of, you know, I spend 10% of my time writing code and 90% of my time debugging. Debugging is a skill that you will develop your whole entire life. <laughs> After you create your program, you save your code within a file. This is also known as a source file. So instead of saving it as a document or a PDF, you save it as a source file. This basically shows you that your source code is within this source file. And just as you would save a PDF as name.extension, which is PDF, you would also save your source file as name extension, which your extension is whatever your code is. So .java is Java, .cpp is C++, so on and so forth. Now, after you save everything in the appropriate source files, you want to run your code to make sure that it works. But before you can run your code or otherwise known as executing your code, you need to make sure that it compiles. You essentially translate your source file from high level language to low level language in the form of an executable so your computer knows what you wrote. Because as we said before, computers don't understand high level language. They only understand low level language. So within that IDE environment, you will use the compiler to compile your code. And that is a process of translating from high level language to low level language. Let me say that one more time. Compiling is a process of translating your high level language, Java, C++, Swift, to low level language, binary, machine language. And in that compilation process, it creates and saves that translated code as an executable file. However, if you have bugs in your code that prevent you from compiling, that's when you need to activate the debugger, figure out how to fix your code, fix it until it is able to compile. Otherwise, it won't be able to create that executable file. And if it's not able to create that executable file, then you're not able to run your application. And that is it for computer science terminology part two and actually the final part of this series. I wasn't sure at the beginning if I wanted to stretch it out to part three, but turns out we were able to just fit it into a two part series. Hope you guys enjoyed it. If there's anything else that you want me to discuss, I'd be happy to just leave them down in the comments below. If you like the video, be sure to like it. And if you dislike it, feel free to dislike the video twice and make sure you subscribe, especially if you did like the video. Until next time, guys, have a good one. Peace.